This is MuggleCast, the Harry Potter podcast discussing everything about J.K. Rowling's wizarding world. Welcome to MuggleCast episode 363. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. All of us are back this week. Isn't that wonderful? And all at the same time, too. (laughs) And all at the same time. Yeah, I guess we were kind of all together last week, but not really. Shh, magic of magic. Magic. And we are joined by a guest this week, one of our Slug Club members over on Patreon, Laura. Welcome to the show, Laura. Hi, guys. Nice to be here. I know you were excited to come on. How long have you been listening to MuggleCast? Oh, I think I've been listening for at least like three or four years. So kind of new, actually. Yeah, kind of newish. Yeah. Let's get your fandom ID. When did you discover the Harry Potter series? Okay, so when I was about... I don't know, 11, 12, I got the first three books for Christmas. And uh, then the fourth one came out, Goblet of Fire, when I was 14. And I, and Harry was 14 in the book. So, like, I really have fond memories of the Goblet of Fire. But I've pretty much been a fan uh, for, oh, God, 15 years at least, 20 almost. <laughs> Harry Potter is a Christmas gift. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that one before, actually. Really? really? <laughs> well, because normally, you know, who can wait for a Harry Potter book? You just pick it up and buy it, right? Well, I guess that's true. Not many of them came out around Christmas. They were always summer books. But Right, right. Yeah. Well, my yeah. mom wanted to check them out first because they were kind of scary. So she wanted to check them out before she gave them to me. Oh, oh, that's that's funny. I love that's that. Funny. Yeah. What's your favorite Harry Potter book and movie? Um, I think maybe Half-Blood Prince is probably my favorite book. Oh, because that's like the last one they're at, actually at Hogwarts. Whereas the movies, I think Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2. Nice. Because I have fond memories of seeing it. I actually got to see Part 2 before anybody else did in the U.S. because I was working abroad at the time, and it released a couple days early there. Oh, Oh. yeah. Right? Did you go on MuggleNet and spoil it for everybody? No. (laughs) I'm not that mean. (laughs) Thank you for abstaining. (laughs) <laughs> Voldemort dies. No. <laughs> what are your Hogwarts and Ilvermorny houses? Well, my Hogwarts house is Slytherin. Um, mm-hmm. I, ch- I don't hear a lot of Slytherins on the podcast, but uh, no, they're all in the dungeons. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and my Ilvermorny house is Wampus. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. What's your favorite? Here's a random one. What's your favorite beast? I was thinking about this one, and I think probably the hippogriffs, like Buckbeak. Uh-huh. I think they're pretty pretty cool. And then finally, what is your Patronus? My Patronus is a piebald stallion. Ooh. Pie, a, piebald? Yeah, it's basically like kind of like a draft horse that's like has painted spots on it. It's hmm. it's really cool. Like what's I, I Googled it and I'm like, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Piebald is a is a style is like a, a pattern, like an organic pattern. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm just happy for all these websites that have information about these random creatures out there. <laughs> After J.K. Rowling launched the Patronus test, suddenly they were getting tons of traffic from Google. When when people like you, Laura, got assigned piebald stallions, and then suddenly they started these websites started getting tons of traffic from Harry Potter fans trying to figure out what a piebald stallion is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very happy for them. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thank you for your support. Thanks. This week's episode is actually a mailbag episode. We haven't done this in a long time and we get tons of feedback from our listeners. We have a really great community. The theme is burning questions this week. We, you know, we've all got those questions Mine, of course, has always been, is Lavender Brown dead or alive? Right. Micah's is, will the owl ever return to the cursed child? <laughs> What's your burning question, Eric? Um, do you have a serious one or a joking one? No, like but I, I do? You know, I don't, I've, I don't, I'll, let me think about that. I'll get back okay. to you. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about a little news first. We now know when the first Harry Potter mobile game is going to be released. It is April 25th. This is Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery. And they also announced that several cast members from the movies are recording dialogue for the game. Maggie Smith, who played McGonagall, Michael Gambon, who played Dumbledore, Warwick Davis, who plays Flitwick, are all part of the game. I was honestly surprised by this. Warwick Davis, like, 
he's always involved in fandom. I guess that didn't surprise me. But Maggie Smith, they got Maggie Smith right. to do this? Right. Like, here, just read these lines as McGonagall. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's pretty easy work, isn't it? No, they could I mean, probably but, come yeah, to her but house still, the and... fact that she would say yes, you know, because there's so many yeah. games. I didn't even think the movie games had her voice, you know? Um, right. On them. So that's pretty impressive. Somebody... I know where, of course, I know where I will be April 25th, though. Oh, we're going to be in New York. Yeah, we're going to be, we're all going to be seeing Cursed Child. This is the day that our uh, infamously purchased uh, Cursed Child tickets uh, are for a double showing that day. So we'll all be in New York together and hopefully not on our phones. I'm implementing a ban. Guys, we got to socialize. We got to, we got to talk about the play. We can't be on our phones playing Hogwarts Mystery all day. Can, can I be playing it while watching the play? Uh, yeah, you've already seen it two times. I'd say that's okay. But Mike <laughs> and I, seen it once. we got to pay attention. Okay. I'm sitting there the whole time with my phone out playing <laughs> this of, Hogwarts mystery sudden, game. All of a sudden during like a tense moment between Albus Severus and uh, Scorpius. Right. We, we hear I, Dame Maggie Smith's voice come out of your phone. <laughs> all right, Saints, please. <laughs> no, I was going to say I drop everything and, and, and start watching the show, mm-hmm. the oh, play. Yeah, okay. To hell with you, Hogwarts Mystery. I need to watch Scorbus not come to fruition. Um, but I am very excited about Hogwarts Mystery. This reminds me of when um, Pokemon Go actually launched for the first time during Leviosa Convention in uh, in Vegas. And I couldn't play it all week, so I was pretty upset. But I have a good track record for not being able to download the coolest new mobile game. Um, so hopefully this uh, Hogwarts Mystery is as successful as uh, Pokemon Go. Why couldn't you... Uh download pokemon go at the convention just would have distracted you i was harry pottering mike i got my freak on okay got my harry potter on that's fair i mean yeah understandable you but... can't you can't you can't be a pokemon fan during a harry potter also, convention. i was gambling i was busy gambling so but <laughs> I was busy gambling. i mean what if like a snorlax showed up on the uh, roulette table oh that would be so cool I literally left my couch to go catch a star uh snorlax at a starbucks down the street one time that was my Pokemon Go moment when I realized I was a little too into the game. Now I have to I still go back. I found to get... Snorlax. I'm very disappointed. Yeah, yeah, he's hard to find. That's why I got off my couch to go catch him. <laughs> uh, but Micah, Eric actually has some exciting news for you. Yeah, man. Uh, I know how much you like the Harry Potter Legos, and uh, news came to me this morning that there's a new splash page up, and Lego.com has a teaser. For upcoming Lego sets, we're getting more Lego Harry Potter, Lego Fantastic Beasts sets. I knew you'd be happy about this news. These are the actual Legos or these are video games? I think these are the actual Legos for now. But um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting. The news... More spoilers. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We knew about a Grindelwald's escape and there's a Hogwarts <laughs> Great Hall that's coming. <laughs> But interestingly, uh, MuggleNet, where I found the news, said that th- this is the first time they've actually used the Lego Harry Potter logo on a set since 2011. So oh. I have a feeling that they're going to be bringing back, you know, maybe not just Fantastic Beasts era Lego sets, but they might be building more, you know, common era Harry Potter's era Lego sets as well. Yeah. So. Well, we've kind of spoken about this. We have spoken about the merchandising side side before. Like, there's a ton of interest in Harry Potter right now, so they should absolutely um, get back to some Harry Potter Lego sets. Yeah, and Mike and I are huge, huge fans of the. That's actually all he all we did the last time he was here was play Lego Harry Potter. We beat the years one through four. Laura, did you ever play the Lego Harry Potter games or or ever build Harry Potter Legos? Yeah, I have the Lego Harry Potter game for my PS4. I think I'm currently on year. Three, I think. Year Do you have the dual set with like that's both all the years? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. You know, I actually wanted to mention that I went looking on the PS4 store built into the video game system, yeah. and the digital version of Lego Harry Potter one through four and five through seven, like all combined into one, it was like ten bucks. Yeah, that's why oh. I got it. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I bought it. I haven't started playing it yet, but. Um, I was very surprised by that. So if anybody's looking to finally get into that, 10 bucks at the PlayStation Store, at least it was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, 
Um, gosh, I got it for thirty. No, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. They're, they're they're actually the best. They're the best Harry Potter video games. I can say that for sure. For sure, it's one of my favorite video games ever. Let's move on to some questions now. We have lots to get to this week. Um, this first one is from Patrick, and it's a theory about Dumbledore and Grindelwald. He says, blows my theory relating to the new Fantastic Beasts trailer, detailing what I believe to be the likely reveal behind Dumbledore and Grindelwald's relationship, particularly the aspects that are often criticized, such as Dumbledore's apparent tendency to sacrifice others rather than be on the front lines himself. Bottom line, I believe that Dumbledore and Grindelwald made an unbreakable vow together before dissolving their friendship, and that this goes a long way towards explaining Dumbledore's behavior. Huh. Should we read this whole thing, or Eric, well, do you want to offer the gist of it? We should read it, absolutely, but we can definitely take turns. So, we've known since the original series that Dumbledore was called on for quite some time to confront Grindelwald in some form or another by the wizarding community, yet he refrained from doing so until their legendary duel in 1945. The reason for his apprehension to face Grindelwald after their parting following the event that ended in Ariana Dumbledore's death is left to speculation. Now in the Fantastic Beasts series, we have confirmation that Dumbledore was actively engaged in the opposition against Grindelwald in the decades leading up to their eventual duel, albeit by proxy via Newt's commander. So, if he is interested in the defeat of Grindelwald, why does it take him 20 plus years to put himself on the front line and bring down what was at the time known to be the greatest dark wizard to have ever lived? Patrick continues, I believe that when Dumbledore tells Newt that he cannot act against Grindelwald and that it must be him, he means it quite literally. I think he's prevented from actually physically confronting Grindelwald by an unbreakable vow that they may have made during their time together in their youth. I believe that during the fever pitch of one of their impassioned political discussions of the world they'd build together in the pursuit of the greater good, that they might have sealed their pact to always work together in pursuit of etc. etc. with an unbreakable vow. The exact wording of a vow I'm totally unsure of, but the essence must somehow prevent Dumbledore from just walking out and casting spells at him to save the day. I don't think Dumbledore would have told anyone the reason for his physical avoidance of Grindelwald, as I'm sure it would have been incredibly shameful to admit this pact with a mass murderer prevents him from saving innocent lives. Now, the obvious reason against this theory is that they do eventually physically fight each other, as we know. And it's unlikely that if there were any unbreakable vow, that Dumbledore manages to break it somehow and then go on to fight Grindelwald. So if they fight, there could have been no vow. But I think there's reason to believe that the duel may have never occurred, or at the very least might have happened quite differently than what we currently imagine. In Deathly Hallows, when advertising for her new biography on Dumbledore in an interview, Rita Skeeter says this of the historic duel, quote, All I'll say is don't be so sure that there actually was the spectacular duel of legend. After they've read my book, people may be forced to conclude that Grindelwald simply conjured a white handkerchief from the end of his wand and came quietly. End quote. Page 26, chapter 2. At the time, we obviously didn't take that for much, but as Harry and the reader discover later on regarding other shocking claims she makes in the interview that we believe to likely be false are actually completely accurate, considering her source, however, unethical was extremely legitimate. So perhaps that's an early clue from Rowling that will come to play here. Perhaps because of the vow, the duel is actually more of a protracted conversation between the two great wizards at long last, in which by some means Grindelwald does actually end up surrendering the Elder Wand to his old friend, which would be consistent with the fact that we know the Elder Wand is supposed to be truly unbeatable in a genuine head-to-head -head contest. So yeah, that's what I think. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's super interesting. Um, it makes sense to me, and I think the lesson during, if, if this were to be true, um, the life lesson would be when you're young, <laughs> you make mistakes not thinking about what could change in the future, <laughs> uh, especially if Dumbledore had feelings for Grindelwald. Um, he would want to maybe do whatever he wanted, or maybe he gets a little blinded by love mm. and he makes these decisions that are probably not smart in the long run yeah i love the idea that dumbledore sort of becomes this character who we know that uses other people for you know to achieve his ends rather than acting on his own but becomes this person because he has no other choice that there is something magical such as an unbreakable vow 
that prevents him from openly confronting Grindelwald until maybe such time as, you know, whether Dumbledore figures out a way past the the, the wording of the vow, like he does for Snape in uh, year six, you know, to, to somehow manage his affairs, still be able to do what needs to be done while honoring the unbreakable vow to save a life. Uh, or maybe it gets forgiven or wears off or something. You know, I I love this idea, um, and I hadn't previously considered it. What do you think, Laura? I I just wonder what the wording would be in order for it to work. You know, because if you break an unbreakable vow, you die, right? Um, presumably. Yeah, so the wording would have to be very interesting in order for him to be able to skirt it somehow, or if there even is a duel in the end, you know, like... I think we'll just have to wait and see. That's that's what I find to be most fascinating. Uh, this quote from Rita Skeeter in Deathly Hallows where she suggests, and, and when you're reading it in Deathly Hallows, you know, 11 years ago, you're like, oh, this is so incendiary. This is so inflammatory. Like, I'm I'm so annoyed with Rita Skeeter right now. She suggests that they there wasn't even a duel after all, which goes back to book one, the famous witches and wizards card, where we read that there's this massive duel in 1945 between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. If it never happened, if Grindelwald just surrendered, then we're in for like a, a, a breaking dawn esque um, talk session that ends the book, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would upset a lot of people though. And, and, and that would further piss off people who don't like that JK Rowling continues to expand her world because it's, it's ruining a lot of aspects What's of the wrong original with them series. Talking it out instead of fighting. Yeah. That is such a disappointment. Yeah. Well, that is I mean, such a disappointment. Doesn't make for a great movie. I see wizard duels in movies now, and I'm just like, I've seen this before. Like any action sequence, any car chase. It's actually car chases that get to me. I'm like, they're destroying so much property, and like I've seen a hundred car chases before. They all look the same. Like wizard wizard duels. You know, I would be interested in the kind of confrontation where Dumbledore and Grindelwald as characters decide to, or Grindelwald lays down his arms and allows himself to be captured. The other thing is he's in his own prison. He's in Ner Nermengard, I want to say it is, um, yeah. for decades and decades and decades, just seemingly waiting. Like Voldemort kills him eventually, but Grindelwald's just sitting there and presumably not trying to escape. So we just don't know all the details. I think there is something to the idea that Grindelwald would, I don't know, be made to surrender or would, or would surrender. Maybe Grindelwald himself, let's think of it from this aspect. If there was an unbreakable vow, maybe Grindelwald is equally bound to it, right? And so the reason well, yeah. that Grindelwald surrenders is because to not do so would be to break his part of the vow and he would die. What do you make of this, Micah? I like the theory. I think that, uh, as Laura mentioned, though, there has to be the wording needs to be very, very specific in order to protect both of them in all this. But it would also lend itself more so to this idea of him being defeated. Why not? And and I know we've talked at length about you know, Dumbledore defeating Grindelwald because of the feelings he may have for him, as opposed mm -hmm. to just outright using a Vada Kedavra or something along those lines. But if there is this vow in play, it would help explain, I think, some of why there's this defeat as opposed to, you know, just outright doing away with him altogether. I also like the point that was brought up uh, referencing the line that we hear in the trailer from Dumbledore saying that mm -hmm. basically it, it has to be Newt. It can't be him. So why can't it be him? Again, there is the relationship element of it to consider, but is there something more underlying that we may not necessarily know about and and this could be it i think it I think it seems plausible that as teenagers there'd be like a blood pact or like you know they're blood brothers they were really close they were talking about dominating the world together um i I feel like you know the wording would be words to that effect like I will not actively contribute to your downfall, da, 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 da. I mean, that, that would be too much, but you know, I will support. I love that. Yeah. Some, and, something, something that just is like de a declaration of their mutual support for each other. And so the magical aspect of it just seems like it would be extra flourish. The fact that 
they're contractually or magically bound to abide by it. But I, I, I actually like the idea of seeing the reuse of the unbreakable vow in this front. I'm not usually a fan of seeing things uh, recur like unregistered animagi or polyjuice. Um, but in this case, I actually really like the idea. I love the theory that an unbreakable vow is what's at, at play in this very, very central pivotal relationship. And remember, we are going to be getting scenes with young, young Dumbledore and young, young Gr Grindelwald. Yeah. So why does it have to be me, Professor? Well, let me show you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you everything. All right. So we also asked this question over on Patreon. Did Dumbledore and Grindelwald create an unbreakable vow? Uh, Gretchen said... This does seem like the kind of thing two invincible-feeling teenagers would do. Yep. Uh, Pablo says, aggressively runs to reread Deathly Hallows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Whitney likes the idea but thinks it's a stretch. It would totally depend on what exactly was in the vow. It would have had to been crafted in a way that Dumbledore could find a loophole to battle Grindelwald later, since we know that neither of them die during the final battle. Uh, unless there's an expiration date on Unbreakable Vows, which seems like it would defeat the point. Statute of limitations, 20 years. Brandy says she doesn't think Dumbledore would make an Unbreakable Vow. Uh, I also think Dumbledore doesn't want to act against Grindelwald. Not that he can't. To me, I feel Dumbledore wants to avoid seeing his lost love as long as possible. That Grindelwald will bring back painful memories of Ariana. I think there's a limit to which Dumbledore would stand by while... People, well, innocent people are dying. Um, granted, sending Newt into the, the folds, you know, he's not necessarily being inactive, but Dumbledore himself would have resigned. I think there is something more going on there than just the heartbreak aspect, because if Dumbledore no longer believes that muggles should be subjugated over wizards, then he, should, he has a, sort of a moral responsibility to get out there sooner and prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two here that kind of touch on the on the same thing, and I'm interested to get your thoughts about Dumbledore after reading them. The first is um, from Anna Carroll. Uh, she says, I don't think Grindelwald would be that careless since he wasn't in entirely sincere in their relationship. I think Ooh. Newt can fly under the radar and Dumbledore's movements are being watched. Um, and then Jen said, no, Dumbledore would never make a vow in my opinion. If we've learned nothing else from Harry Potter, it's that Dumbledore plays the super long game. I don't think we will ever know how, but he knows who to play and when, and it's all to the end goal. I don't personally believe that he ever knows the whole thing, but he knows enough about where things need to lead to find the appropriate people and situations to push everything to that culminating moment. And like we saw continuously with Harry and team, without the experiences that he pushed them into, they would not have grown and learned and been able to, at the end, do everything that they did. Maybe that's also the plan with Newt, continually pushing him so he learns and grows. Mm. Again, though, I, I think by saying all these things about Dumbledore, it, it's making him appear to be infallible. And I don't think that's the case, right? When we, when we read about him in, in Deathly Hallows and mm. we learn about uh, some of his, his past... Um, endeavors, particularly seeking out the Deathly Hallows, it seems perfectly plausible that back in the day, especially, you know, having feelings for Grindelwald, that the two of them could have done something along these lines. I, I don't like the idea of just dismissing Dumbledore because he's Dumbledore. Yeah, he's not a choir boy. Like, we actually don't like Dumbledore. Like, Dumbledore actually mistreated Harry, raised him like a pig for slaughter, and it was a big issue. I just want to see, like, how do you think he became this this master plotter with, um, you know, people in the right places, in the right towns, in the right cadence, with the right setup? And I think it's because he had no other choice. I really do subscribe to this theory um, wholeheartedly. And I think that the way you become somebody like that who has to use other people to achieve your ends is when there's a magical force that's preventing you from directly acting. So, I mean, I, I think Dumbledore is... A very brilliant person. We've just, we've seen him discover the twelve uses of dragon's blood, or we've heard about it, and you know all that other stuff. But I think that he was in a pickle because you know of his previous uh, because of his misspent youth, 
And I think that that kind of shapes him. I would love to see something like this be the, be the thing that shapes him into the Dumbledore we know. And you know what? I'd love if the Dumbledore in Fantastic Beasts isn't the fully formed same exact Dumbledore that we see uh, from the 90s, you know, in, in the original Harry oh, Potter yeah. film. No, yeah, we should see a slightly different one. All right. Well, thank you to Patrick for that theory. So let's get over to some burning questions. These were submitted via Twitter.com slash MuggleCast and Facebook.com slash MuggleCast. What have fans wanted to know after all these years? What is still bugging them? And we're going to start with Laura's burning question. For years, this has bugged her. (laughs) And she has to know the answer. What is it, Laura? What is your question? Curse child. And I can hear the collective <laughs> groan. But not one for thing me. That's I love it. Me. <laughs> Hashtag Scorbus. Um, <laughs> so the, the thing that's bugged me is I read or heard somewhere, I think it might have been Joe said this, that since Voldemort was conceived under a love potion, it means he's incapable of feeling love. So that being said, how could he have fathered a child? Like, is physical love the same as romantic slash emotional love? Like, is it more like yeah. of an asexual kind of a deal? It's just been bugging me. Cause, and then also Bellatrix, it's like she's married. What happened to, like, Rodolphus? Like, I don't know. Right. You know he's in me. Azkaban. He writes letters, but it's not the same. Um, <laughs> I'm confused. I'm genuinely, Laura, I'm so glad we have you on so I can ask a follow-up question. Sure. You know that love and sex are different. I know, right? I know, and that's oh, what's okay. bugging me too, because it's like. Well, so what's what's the, actually the question here? <laughs> I guess the the main question is: Is he capable of getting it on with anybody? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I see. I disagree with that, though. It's very out of Voldemort's character, and this this was easily like the most shocking development in the cursed child. Yeah. Um, it certainly plays well on the stage, I guess, once once you realize what's going on or what happens. Um, but, yeah, it's just not in Voldemort's character. We know it's in Bellatrix's character, and I'm sure we've spoken about this before. We know that she was interested in Voldemort yeah, uh, yes. romantically. She's very Absolutely. often described as his as going to great lengths to ensure that everyone knows she's his most loyal follower. Yeah. So was um, it just one crazy night? That were they out partying? And, <laughs> and I'll, I'll agree. I'll agree. It's not in his character at all to father a child. I will absolutely agree. But I think he's capable of it, a hundred percent. But I don't think he would. Like Voldemort is not about to make himself vulnerable in that way. Where when you're intimate with somebody else, there's a vulnerability there. Yeah. And he's also not seeking. Like Voldemort is very much, we talked about this when the first details of Cursed Child and Andrew, when you first saw it, but like, I've always felt that, um, you know, there's two ways to live forever. Right. And the, one of them is to have children who have children who have children who remember your teachings, who remember you, who honor your memory through their lives. That's the long game. Voldemort's not interested in playing that Voldemort's, you know, that involves you dying and your, your, your progeny, your, your children, your descendants all you know, carrying on your name. And that's one form of immortality. Voldemort just doesn't want, ever want to die. And so he's not going to go and seek out, you know, uh, a person, even if it's closest follower to have a child with so that, you know, and he's not going to raise a child, you know, he's, he's very selfish. He's very interested in extending his own physical life and that's, you know, bottom line, that's all he's interested in. So, so, so you're saying that maybe he had, an idea when Bellatrix was hitting on him one night, maybe I do want to continue the Voldemort family tree. I don't consider and, considering how obsessed he is with blood status, his kid would be half blood or wor- like like less quarter. I, I don't I don't know. I'm just I'm confused. I think it's I, absolutely possible though for him to have a child. Um, this is the one question I wish J.K. Rowling <laughs> would address concerning the Cursed Child. She has stayed quiet about developments in the Cursed Child. You know, I've theorized that maybe because she wasn't a little proud, wasn't very proud of it, but also just because hashtag keep the secrets. Okay, that's that's fair. But now 
the show's been happening for at least a, a close to two years now. It's about to open on Broadway, so tons more people are going to see it. I think it's time for her to answer some questions about the cursed child. She signed off on all this. I would, I would feel much better about it knowing her thinking. I don't care what her thinking is. I just want to know it. Yes. Yeah. And then I'll feel better about it. Agreed. Yeah, that's completely fair. You have to think she has a decent answer in her head, right? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> probably. Look, you're right. She signed off on this. Cursed Child is canon, she tweeted. Um, so, okay, what are the implications? You know, there's a couple of things about, and I, I think we'll be talking a little bit more about Cursed Child, especially after we see it. I know due to the success of the 777 challenge, we're going to do a live episode, I think, pretty much right after we see it. But, um, you know, one of the things that I find interesting is Delphi Diggory or Delphi Nee Lestrange, whatever her name is, um, you know, Delphi grew up and she grew up knowing who she was or who or what she was. And she grew up trying to impress Voldemort. Like there's there's a lot of story there that I think could be very interesting if it were written by J.K. Rowling. And there's some potential there. And I want to know the implications like this is a character that every Harry Potter fan in the world is being asked to uh, believe existed and truly exists. And so I feel like as I feel like it'll help if Rowling actually speaks towards some of this rather than kind of hiding from it as she might be. All right, let's move on to some of these other burning questions. This one's from Law Rin. This goes with a discussion from a few weeks ago about Bogarts. In Order of the Phoenix, they wait for Moody to check a cabinet for Bogart. So does he know what one looks like because of his magical eye? I've Possibly. Always, I've always thought yes, but it's weird because Moody's eye can't be completely unique. Like somebody somewhere manufactured that eye for him. Hmm. Um, I'm sure. Right. I mean, more than one wizard ever has lost an eye. Uh, so what I'm getting at is nobody knows what a Bogart looks like um, in its true form. And a Bogart doesn't take shape, uh, f you know, away from its true form until it sees you and gauges what your fears are. So the fact that Moody I think it's, yeah, they're in Grimald Place and Moody, um, you know, Molly Weasley's talking about there's this uh, bumping and thumping up above in a cupboard or something. And and Moody, like his eye spins to the back of his head. He looks up and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a bugger. Um, All I, right, I, kids, move over. I'll yeah. see what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Not even move over. He'll just look through them, their x-ray skeleton through them. I wonder if his eye gives off radiation. Anyway, um <laughs> Mad Eye, okay, kids, we all have cancer now. Um, we invited Uncle Moody to Thanksgiving. This next one is from Nina. Okay, here's a good one. Where and how do wizards watch the Quidditch games of the teams they follow? Or do they just apparate to games? I don't think they'd be free. Yeah, like what's like the ESPN of the wizarding world? Mm. Micah, you're a sports guy. Yeah. How would you deal with this if you're a Quidditch fan? Would you go out to all the games? Would you try to launch your own network? It's a good Micah Wizarding World Sports Network. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a that's a pretty good question. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, right? If how do they follow? I mean, do they just read a recap of the match in uh, the Daily Prophet or whatever the local paper is, or how do they get updates? Yeah. You know, if it, it, do you actually? I, I mean, I guess it, it's it's actually social to have to go out to the game and, and cheer on your team as opposed to like sitting on your couch and watching from afar. But that's a great question. Cause you obviously you can't make it to every single game that the team plays, but how do you, how do you follow along? Like radio, they seem to use radio a little bit in the series, but yeah, I don't know. Television doesn't seem to be something that they're, um, that they're too keen on unless, you know, maybe they can like use some magic to uh, throw the game up on a screen somewhere or I don't know that that would be my <laughs> guess, right? Like maybe there's a, a way that they can just kind of conjure up the match and, yeah. and, and watch it 
in in you know the hogshead or the leaky cauldron or something like that well what it is is that quidditch uh matches are always televised through the flu network you just uh, view it through your fireplace right um that would probably make the most sense (laughs) i don't know i i feel like the daily prophet uh has like a photo like a magical photo of like a game saving win you know like your game winning save you know something that like the highlights would be printed in the prophet so you could watch you know visually what 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 like what the highlights are um and they report like the score but i think for the most part people probably would travel to their team's quidditch game and a lot of countries are a lot smaller than the united states too you don't need to travel That's too true. too too far more than a couple hours to get somewhere um i think yeah maybe their most loyal followers would go to each game and i but i can't imagine the fee is greater than you know a couple sickles or something here's another one from nina do all i've always wondered this one myself do all the teachers live 24 7 in hogwarts what about their families if they have a partner does the partner move the hogwarts too really answered this on pottermore but i don't know that it's consistent um there's evidence of neville and i think hannah abbott living or renting out a room uh, above the Leaky Cauldron in London, and they later moved to Hogsmeade. So even though they're not living at Hogwarts, they're still close to Hogwarts. Um, but I think in the McGonagall backstory, it's mentioned that she lived at, at Hogwarts for a time over the summer. It just seems very draining, though, to be stuck at Hogwarts all the time. I mean, you know, in the in the real world here, we don't love being stuck at work all the time. So, yeah. Where's the room for their personal lives? Yeah, that's that's fair. I'm I'm looking at um for a time McGonagall and her husband lived in Hogsmeade. Oh, and, and Hogsmeade. that was yeah, okay. and that was after Voldemort's first defeat. So she seemed to be there for some time. But think about also, you know, there's so many scenes in the book where the professors are there in the middle of the night. Yeah, in their in their <laughs> night clothes. Right, right. Like they're always there. Worst job ever always working this is from libby the shrieking shack did it exist prior to remus lupin coming to hogwarts or did ghosts coincidentally move in after he started attending the school when the villagers notice a new dilapidated shack i like that there's got to be some history to the shrieking shack right before before dumbledore i yeah i mean this old shack if it was only recently haunted in the 1970s when remus comes there yeah. That is questionable. Yeah. I'm just looking it up. I'm not seeing much history prior to the events of Prisoner of Azkaban. But yeah, you have to think it's been there for a long ass time and it's got some storied history about it, how it became haunted. Maybe I think it would be like a JK Rowling thing to do to like it was haunted, but Dumbledore took care of the ghosts. <laughs> like, you know, and now he used it for his purposes. But like it used to be haunted, but it's completely been purged or exercised or maybe that's where some of the other ghosts that hogwarts come from he's like "Eh, you know i got this castle just come live up there and torment the students it's cool um i need the space (laughs) this next one's from evelyn what's the deal with hermione's parents how come they're so (laughs) cool with pretty much not seeing her because she's mostly at the burrow during holidays i thought of that too really what what's your theory here then I just think they're like, okay, well, she has friends, so go see your friends. But I know, like, for me, I would want to be with my parents during the holidays if I was at boarding school, you know? Yeah. I guess it's just one of those things where you have to make sacrifices in the plot. (laughs) Like, things aren't going to add up, but we... Yeah. But Hermione does need to be in town, so... I will admit, there were one or two scenes where, where, like, Harry goes to the bird, and I'm like, Hermione's here? Why? Like, is she not with her family? Like, who... But I think it's a, a heck of a, a predicament because they want to support their daughter and their daughter's a witch. Like they – thank God they can see Diagon Alley. But there's so much of the world that they can't participate in as her parents that you know, they've reached an understanding. They seem to have reached an understanding quite early in her life that they would not be seeing her very often. J.K. Rowling should have written something on Pottermore like – after her years at Hogwarts, Hermione moved back home to spend much, much earned time with her parents. Yeah. And then we'd all be like, oh, okay. All right. Good. Problem solved. Yeah. 
Victor says, how did Voldemort acquire a rudimentary body? You will never know. We, we will never well, know. What JK. are we talking about here in the timeline? We're talking about after his first defeat? Yeah, between, so. between the point where he's a wisp of smoke at the end of Sorcerer's Stone and when he's the baby-ish character that Voldemort resuscitates um, right. after Prisoner of Azkaban before Goblet of Fire. So I've just been doing some reading on that, and there was a rudimentary body potion that Voldemort might have invented himself, consisting of snake venom and unicorn blood. Yeah, that's the and... thing that, that Voldemort is surrounded by beings and creatures with unique magical purposes, such as Nagini's special venom. Michael says, I want to know what happened to the chambers connected to the third floor used to protect the Sorcerer's Stone after the stone was removed. Storage, magical experiments, <laughs> secret professor club. I like the last I one. Turned in, I like the secret I bet professor be, club. <laughs> I bet that was all room of requirement playing some secret tricks on us. Oh. I, I just I love the idea of storage. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> For the teachers who don't know about the room of requirement, they're just like, yeah, actually, I have all these boxes of old test papers I got to um, put away. A secret professor club would be cool, like a um, like an airline, like an airport lounge, you know, like a special double triple A rewards club member lounge kind of thing. But for pr professors, it'd be pretty cool. Maybe they just shut it down, kind of like how in the real world it's a dark thought. But like when there's a shooting from say a hotel room in las vegas mm. they sh they shut down that suite to never be used again right maybe hogwarts just shut it down because it is kind of a dark place now like voldemort was in there with quirrell and dumbledore didn't know it like that's kind of embarrassing for the school so sure all right so we have some uh text messages and emails and voicemails to get to still but our sponsor this week is zip recruiter are you hiring? Every business needs great people and a better way to find them. Something better than posting your job online and just praying for the right people to see it. It can be a real hassle. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply to your job. So it's a super streamlined process. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And I know when you're looking to hire, that can uh, the, the speed at which you can find candidates can be so helpful. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there, and ZipRecruiter is how you find them. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That is right, for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MuggleCast. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MuggleCast. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Let's hire some text messages now. This first one's from Kate. She says, hi, MuggleCast. Just wondering if you guys think Credence ever got an Ilvermorny acceptance letter. Does it trace the recipient like the Hogwarts one does? Wouldn't these letters help bring down the ratings of Obscurials? Can't wait to hear your thoughts. Uh -huh. Poor Credence. I hope he got an Ilvermorny letter. Oh, it's... A good question, but I wonder, given what we've learned about him, would he get an acceptance letter to Ilvermorny? Would that not be the wrong school for him to go to? Even though oh, I know Hogwarts, he... you mean? <laughs> well, no, even something in Paris, if he is, you know, the the child of a Lestrange and uh, in Paris, what was it Clarice Tremblay? Yeah. So should he should he go to Beaubaton? Yeah. I don't know. Hmm. Very Could he have, so maybe he hasn't been an acceptance letter because he's just kind of all over the place. Well, I love the idea that saying. it um, would it would reduce the number of obscurials, though, like boarding schools where if your uh, parents reject you because you're different or strange, that you are then welcomed with open arms to these boarding schools um, to stay like year round. I don't get exactly what she means by this, though. Wouldn't these letters help bring down the readings of Obscurials? Well, because, like, if you are feeling alone and, like, nobody can help, you're going to probably try and suppress your magic. But if you're invited with open arms to a school to hone ah. your craft, then it's like, oh, I'm not alone after all. I'll be, like, with people, like, of my kind. Kind right. Of 
but when you still feel sub- suppressed because like look at credence like his mom wasn't about to let him go to hogwarts well his mom died i know but if he got one i mean oh you mean his adoptive mother you mean um yeah is it yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah her <laughs> yeah i think that what's her name a uh, barebone um, mary lou uh, mary lou thank you Hello? i just mean like, like mary lou wouldn't have let him go to hogwarts so right and I think it'd be really sad if he never got a letter, you know, it's just like, oh, well, I'm still yeah. waiting on my letter, but OK. <laughs> Aren't you? <laughs> well, yeah, that too. But <laughs> Sarah on Patreon says, I left a voicemail about this months ago. Think about how the letters attacked the Dursleys until he opened the letter. Wouldn't the Elvermorny letter do the same thing? Oh. Yeah, that's a good point. Like he'd probably continue getting hit with them. <laughs> maybe that's what traumatized him and made him want to be a, uh, a recluse all the same it's like i don't want to go to a school that keeps sending me letters and hitting me on the head with them yeah exactly this is salacious this is spam this is <laughs> wacky people i don't want to be a wizard oh man next one this is from joe i used to listen to the show in 2012 and have recently gone back into it as a patron welcome back joe so glad you guys do this. Makes my commute infinitely better. I'm up to date on the newest podcast, and I'm working my way backwards as well. I just heard you guys discuss the potential of Newt owning the Elder Wand since he disarmed Grindelwald. It's definitely an interesting theory to discuss. I think Dumbledore's line in the new Fantastic Beast trailer gives that theory more weight now. It has to be you. Perhaps the reason Dumbledore believes it has to be Newt is because he thinks the allegiance of the Elder Wand belongs to Newt. No theory is safe. Thank you, and keep up the awesome podcasting. Glad we got this text message because it provides an alternate theory as to why Dumbledore tells Newt it has to be him. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be Newt because Dumbledore can't act because there's an unbreakable vow. Although I love that theory and it's now my new favorite. Um, it could just be that uh, the he thinks that or he thinks that he knows where the Elder Wand's allegiance is. It has to be you, Newt, because Elder Wand's possession is yours. Duh, duh. And you know what? We've said this a lot. On the last 10 or so episodes, but somebody keeps pointing out, actually, people keep pointing out, um, particularly Mr. Glass on Twitter, that Newt is not the person who disarmed Grindelwald. The person who disarmed Grindelwald was, in fact, Tina Goldstein. So in Fantastic Beasts 2, Tina and Newt are going to reunite early on in the movie. Tina's going to surprise Newt. Newt's going to get scared, cast a spell at her, disarm her, (laughs) thereby getting possession of the Elder Wand. And then it has to be you, Newt. You have possession. (laughs) Yeah. So I think I think that part was interesting because Newt Newt casts the spell that is later said to be Revilio, which causes, you know, Grindelwald to become unmasked. But apparently it's actually Tina that does the uh, disarm charm. So pretty cool. Tina is the master of the Elder Wand right now. On to some emails. This is from Jillian. She is basically asking, there was no Nicholas Flamel in the new trailer. What's up with that? Uh, There wasn't a name drop, an image, or even a hint to him. The only reason I even remembered him was seeing the graveyard wand scene with Newton and his brother. It made me wonder if an ingredient to make the elixir of life had to be found in a graveyard. How best to avoid death than by using death itself. Interesting idea. Interesting. I like that theory. I was going to say Nicholas Flamel's appearance in the movie is going to be a surprise, but then again, they announced it on purpose on Pottermore, the official fan resource of the Wizarding World. That's right. So, like, why bother? It would have been cool if they kept that a secret. Like, why not just try to keep that a secret? Right, because now we're asking, where is he? I just think he's, yeah, I don't know. I'm still too worried there's too much happening in this series now. Maybe it is connected to uh, the graveyard. Maybe, in fact, you guys remember Beetlejuice when they have to dig, dig, dig up, like dig the grave to get to Beetlejuice. Uh-huh. When he comes up. Maybe Nicholas Fumel is living underground, literally underground at the graveyard, and they have to go not knock on the headstone. And then he comes up, and he's perfectly immortal and alive. I don't know. Uh, this next one's from Diana. I'm listening to the first teaser trailer episode, and you guys were debating if Dumbledore was standing by Big Ben. I believe he is standing at the top of St. Paul's Cathedral. I attached the view as if you're standing in the dome of St. Paul's. 
However, Christopher Wren designed 50 churches after the Great Fire of London, so it could be any one of his. I loved the trailer, and I wonder why Dumbledore says he can't go after Grindelwald and that it has to be Newt. Is it just emotional, or is there another reason behind it? Um, and then, Eric, did you do some looking into this? Yeah, uh, I looked. Um, I wasn't able to recreate the exact. I actually found, I did on my own research, I Google imaged St. Paul's Cathedral, London. There's plenty of St. Paul's Cathedrals, so be sure to specify London. Um, <laughs> and the I pulled up the trailer. Uh, with Newt and Dumbledore, and I kind of viewed them side by side. And yeah, based on the way that the um, roofs are and that clock, which has a black face with gold uh, lettering or gold numbering, um, right above that, there's these two sort of like gargoyle type, um, or maybe they're lions, stone animals, all the same. And the way that the carapace and all that architecture term um you know it looks the same so absolutely i deduce that i strongly believe the scene in the trailer is taking place in london when dumbledore sort of apparates or newts like right behind him and then he turns wistfully and smiles so uh there yeah, will be a I, scene yeah it's not surprising be... when you think about the hogwarts scenes so we yeah. know they're in that country at least <laughs> yeah well i think it just plays to what exactly is newt what sends newt to paris like in the trailer we see him recreating this postcard that had been ripped to shreds and is that his indicator go to go to paris did dumbledore leave that message for him or that clue for him to be found you know and dumbledore and newt are meeting at night in the rain or something when he says it has to be you but also during the day and it just kind of i i think that we'll be uh, privy to several scenes of Newt and Dumbledore in this film. It's good to know that one of them can at least be confirmed based on the excellent recreation of the set to be a place in London, which is a little bit closer to home than France. Mm -hmm. So this will be their meeting spot. Yeah. Where he sends the Newt signal from. It's a really cool clock. What does that look like? You know, like the bat signal, it's the Newt signal. Probably a um, swooping evil tied into a the uh, not Thestral um, demigeist. I think it's an elder wand. <laughs> <laughs> it was Newt's symbol all along. He is the master. <laughs> okay, let's listen to some voicemails now. Hey, MuggleCast, this is Justin. Uh, I'm a longtime listener. I uh, never called in the voicemail before, but I saw you were asking for burning questions, and I figured I'd bring this one up. I could bring up about 40 other ones that are all uh, right around my head, but I figure we'll, we'll stick to one. Um, why couldn't Quirrell get the stone? Obviously, you say it, it's an easy answer, but Dumbledore said you had to, you could only get it if you wanted to get it, but not use it. Quirrell stated when he was looking at the, at the mirror that he saw himself presenting the stone to Voldemort. That's not using the stone. Voldemort wanted to use it. So Quirrell should have been able to get it. Dumbledore says it's one of his best thoughts ever. You had to have just wanted it and not used it. Technically, that's what Quirrell wanted to do. I guess technically he had to use it to make Voldemort a body so that he could give it to him, but that wasn't really his thought process. So in my mind, technically, he should have had, that should have been a workaround that Dumbledore didn't think of. So, I mean, I know it's semantics and it helps the plot device go on, but Rowling is just so good with her words. I would have thought in the previous statement, Quirrell would have said, I see myself making the elixir to bring my master back to life, not I see myself giving the stone to my master. Just a thought. Uh, like I said, there's 20 million other questions I'm sure everyone can ask, but that's the one I figured I'd send in to you. All right, man. All right, guys, I... uh I appreciate it over the years. It's been fun. Uh, I look forward to hearing everything else y'all get to talk about. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks, Justin. He wanted it to pass it on. Like he mm. was still, he, he, he wasn't using it, but <laughs> I'm let's, getting caught in the semantics yeah, let's, now. Let's uh, remember that Voldemort is sharing Quirrell's body. So in order for Quirrell, in order for Voldemort to eat or drink or use or hold anything Quirrell's body is the one that's got to be the one doing it right. um so i think that probably now i do i do think there's an a gross oversimplification in the way that dumbledore says it surely the mirror is a little bit more complicated but he's explaining it to an 11 year old like yeah 
I guess so. I think that I think there's enough little nuance there in the fact that Quirrell, you know, Voldemort was sharing Quirrell's body, and that Dumbledore was oversimplifying it to say, okay, it it didn't work. But in the end, I, I think I could agree that there's you know slight issue there. But like, but he, but Quirrell was using it in a way. He wasn't right. using it in the typical way. You're, he wasn't using it to live forever, but he was using it to pass it on to Voldemort. It's being used in some way, just not the one way. You know what I mean? Like using could be a broad word, a well, broad let's look, description. Let's look at what Harry what wanted, is using right? it. Yeah, Harry mm-hmm. wanted to escape with it to prevent others from using it. The non-use. I, I don't know. I find it so interesting that J.K. Rowling used the device which shows you your heart's de- de- like deepest desire to introduce this artifact to begin with. Um, it was kind of weird the way that that happened. Yeah. But Harry's wish was to not use it, and I think that makes all the difference. All right. Here's another voicemail. Hi, guys. Gorishma here from Philly. Um, I guess my question is, uh, why didn't the Ministry of Magic call upon other ministry of, ministries of magic um, in other parts of the world to help in the fight against Voldemort? Um, just curious about what your thoughts are about that. Um, okay, thanks. Have a good day. Bye. Well, J.K. Rowling has the same thought as you're having here and in these fantastic beast movies we're going to learn that these other ministries of magic abroad are very incompetent and that you will think, explain your is question that a fact? no i'm kidding oh okay i see i would guess that it's the stance that the ministry takes because fudge for the longest time denies anything is wrong and so the True. reason they don't reach out to the other countries is because they don't want to be perceived as weak for having let this mass murderer loose again um, so I think it's it's more that line. Like the the reason that more ministries aren't called in is because uh, England denies that there's anything wrong to begin with. Yeah, well, that's a great point. Until it's too late. Until it's too late. And it's just another thing. It's like just imagine J.K. Rowling writing in all this outside help as well. I mean, just think of the Battle of Hogwarts. That was insane enough with all these different characters. It would have been a hundred longer pages. Yeah, right. We just didn't have time for that. We but we we didn't get in good uh Lupin and Tonks death scenes as it was. Yeah, that's very true. And I mean, I think to be fair, it's sort of like hinted at and alluded to like book 4 really grows the world of Harry Potter. You find out about these other schools of magic. You see dozens upon dozens of students from those other schools of magic. And the and the message in that book is international magical cooperation. And it's huge. And yeah. yes, I think it doesn't it, it fails to pay off a little bit um with involvement from the other countries. Voldemort is explained or understood to be a threat to the entire world, not just Europe, uh not just England. But he's basically contained to Hogwarts because he has such a solitary focus in killing Harry Potter that the stuff around the world that he's affecting is just not shown in the Harry Potter books. All right, one more voicemail today. Hey, guys. In episode 361, you know, we're specula- speculating about Armando Dippet. And you mentioned that he died in 1992 at a really advanced age. And I, mid-laundry folding, was struck with a crazy theory. What if Armando Dippet was a pseudonym for that other character we know died at a very old age that year, Nicholas Flamel? So I did a fandom deep dive that I in no way had time for over Easter weekend and found (laughs) no real evidence for or against. I even looked into name origins, guys. Armando is Spanish for of the army and his initials match Dumbledore's. Uh, But his wiki birth and death dates are totally based on movie props, which don't really constitute canon in my mind. Just really impressively careful viewing. While he was definitely headmaster by 1942, we don't know how much before that he took the post. But we do know that while Flamel went to Beauxbatons, by Chamber of Secrets, he was retired in Devon. 
So him having worked in the UK for a while seems reasonable. I'd assume Flamel lived most of his life incognito, as Voldemort would not have been the only person who'd have liked to have gotten his hands on the stone. So why not hang out at Hogwarts to be able to work more closely with Dumbledore on their joint research? Interestingly, while IMDb lists the actor playing Flamel, there's no mention of Dippet yet. What do you guys think? On a slightly different topic, if the room we see Dumbledore in in the trailer is the defense classroom at that point, it belongs to longtime teacher Galatia Maryfutt, and I really hope we meet her in this series. Those are my thoughts. Thanks so much. Talk to you later. Uh, wow, this this deep dive theory. I don't know what to say. I I I just I just feel like Armando Dippet is probably a little too inside baseball for this major series, film series. When time is of the essence, time is limited in these movies. Um, so I I I can't imagine this coming to fruition. But I appreciate that you dropped everything on a busy day like Easter and research this theory. Yeah. Um, I think that Professor or that Nicholas Flamel is probably enjoying some time with his wife, Perinelle, over in France, and it's unlikely that he would spend his days and nights being headmaster of Hogwarts. Yeah. Um, yeah. While it's true that he and Dumbledore worked together on alchemy, and I'd love to see that backstory where a four or 550 year old Nicholas Flamel reaches out to a very young Dumbledore, you know, to correspond. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think they work together so closely that they need to both be at Hogwarts. By the way, Victor's bringing up a good point in the chats on Patreon. He says, in a way, Quirrell did want to use the stone if he's interested in power. He would have personally gained from Voldemort returning. Oh, yeah, that was true. my point. There's just different ways to use the stone that that isn't explicitly using it to live. Forever. Good. good point. All right. Well, that wraps up the mailbag portion of today's episode. Thank you to everybody who's been submitting questions. We really appreciate it. This podcast has always had a great community around it, and it's always great when we can get everybody's feedback, questions, answers, complaints onto the show. We can work together to sort through things. Uh, we love our listener community here on MuggleCast. All right, we have a bit of a P.O. Box update. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done this, um, but we do uh, often mention that we have a P.O. Box. Uh, The address, of course, is 4044 North Lincoln Avenue, number 144 in Chicago, IL 60618. Anyway, um, we've been getting a little bit of a backup here, so I just want to mention a a big shout-out and thank you to people who uh, sent stuff to us via the P.O. Box. So it's super funny, but we recently sent out those, um, like another round of uh, album art, round two, year two album art and stickers. And we actually got a thank you card back um, from one of our patrons, Andrew V, who said uh, it was a card with Hermione on the front saying, nevertheless, she persisted. And the inside was thank you for the awesome card and stickers. Um, We got a Christmas card from Amanda Miller. It was really lovely, but it's Christmas, so I don't want to dwell on it, uh, how backed up we are on these uh, P.O. Box updates. We actually got a Valentine's card from Thomasina Taylor, who let her children uh, ages, I think, two and three and a half decorate. And so there's stickers. It's just like covered in stickers. It looks like Mr. Weasley trying to mail, you know, or or Ron trying to mail Harry uh, that letter. So that was really lovely. Uh, And Thomasina says she's been listening to MuggleCast since episode five. Some people know I'm a big Star Trek fan. Sonya R. sent an iron-on patch that features Scotty, Spock, and Kirk from the original Star Trek series playing rock, paper, scissors. Thank you very much. We got another Valentine's card from Tyler and LeClaire, who are in a long-distance relationship with each other, and our podcast helps bring them closer uh, by giving them something to talk about. They sent a Valentine's Day card as well. This one has a cute picture of Dumbledore on front, and it says, I a Dumbledore you. That's cute. And a couple of bigger things we got. Actually, actual physical gifts. I know Andrew's really excited about this uh, last one that I'm going to mention. But uh, Mary H., who's a Gryffindor slash Hufflepuff, sent us a copy of the Wizard Rockumentary 
uh, which is a documentary. Michael De La Tour, who's also a patron of ours, sent us uh, actually really cool special envelopes. So I'm going to give you uh, you guys yours when we're in New York together. But uh, mine contained a Time Turner, a Deathly Hallows necklace, and also one that says Muggle Worthy with like a little case and a little eye sticking out. It's the coolest thing that I had never seen before. Um, and finally, Tasha, Andrew. I, I've sent Andrew a picture. I couldn't. I couldn't wait. But Tasha, a listener of MuggleCast and Millennial, sent Andrew a housewarming gift recently, which is this 2018 Bruce Springsteen official 18 month calendar. You know, I am always so flattered when people think of me and my interests, and uh, this just hits it on the head. So thank you so much, Tasha. For this calendar, I will absolutely put it in the center of my home and stare at it longingly every day. That's great, though. That's really thoughtful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks to everybody for sending it in. Uh, If I missed your name or what you sent, I apologize. I did, in fact, get it. It's it's the P.O. Box is working. Um, Thank you all very much for your kindness and thoughtfulness in you know, sending stuff back. And the letters that we get are really, really heartfelt and really special uh, to us. And I save, I keep them all. So thank you very much. So time for another exciting uh, round of Quizich. Last week's question, of course, was in book four, uh, what does Imposter Moody make Lavender Brown do under the Imperious Curse in the classroom scene from Goblet of Fire? And the correct answer is that under the Imperious Curse, Imposter Moody makes Lavender Brown imitate a squirrel. And uh, the answers that were submitted, (laughs) including Mama underscore Ravenclaw, who sent an animated gif of a squirrel. (laughs) This is close up of its face and mouth. Just, I don't know, doing a thing. I love Twitter. Um, The correct answers were submitted by Wayfaring Witch, Mama Ravenclaw, Kelly Morgan, uh, Jennifer St. George, Andrew Hill, and of course, Sean Brady, who's on a winning streak of getting the correct answer over on Twitter. So thanks to everybody who uh, either remembered that from memory. It's more impressive if you do this from memory, but uh, I understand some of these are very deep dives. Submit your answers and play along with us on Quizich over on Twitter, as these people do, and you get your shout out on the show. Um, so next week's question is <clears throat> as follows. For Harry's 17th birthday, what color did Hermione turn the leaves of the Weasley's crabapple tree? Crabapple. However you say that word. Oh, that's so easy. Give me something harder. Well. I'm completely kidding. Oh, okay. Because I have another one. Okay. (laughs) No, I'm completely kidding. Yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) And uh, again, submit through Twitter. Thanks so much. And thank you, everybody, for listening as well. Do check out our website, MuggleCast.com. You can listen to all the episodes there. Please also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You'll get updates on the show there. We're starting a thing where we post some highlights from the show in video form so you can easily listen to them in your social media streams. Hashtag engagement. Hashtag promo. Hashtag um uh make it easy to listen to clips from the show okay we'd also appreciate if you shared the show with others we love getting these it's normally through twitter we hear from people who recently discovered mugglecast and the thing that they seem to always say is where has mugglecast been all my life how am i just discovering this it's now right here right right here right here Th- that's what i say every sunday laura i got to ask you how did you get into mugglecast Oh, well, I was just looking for Harry Potter podcast to listen to at work and came across okay. this one and had heard about it from other people, too. So here I am. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, the most recent person to discover the show, at least on Twitter, seems to be Rebecca, who said, how as a 26 year old Harry Potter fan, am I only finding MuggleCast now? Hmm. Then she says, makes you think what else is out there? <laughs> 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 oh, ain't that the truth? What else is out there in that crazy, crazy world? Laura, I hope you had a good time today on the show. I did. Awesome. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. And thank you for your support over on patreon.com slash mugglecast. Are you looking forward to your mug? Yes, I am. (laughs) Good. And we want to let people. You already have a Slytherin mug, though. Will you get another house color? 
Well, I got my mom the Gryffindor one. So oh. Okay. I might have to complete the collection. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So we are going to be sending out house-themed mugs to those of you who pledge $5 or more over on Patreon. We actually have decided we're not going to completely close off signups yet for that. Even though we've surpassed the 7-7 challenge, which is, which is amazing, we want to give you the opportunity, if you haven't uh, taken advantage of it yet, sign up on patreon.com slash mugocast now, pledge $5, uh, $5 a month. And in a few months, you will be eligible to receive the mug. But by next week, we're probably going to shut it down completely. Yeah. So last last call, everybody, for last call this year's patron gift. For your, last call for your butter beers and your mugs. Thanks everybody for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Aaron. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.